Hi, my name is Raleigh Seamster from Google. I'm excited to kick off the Social Inclusion Lightning Talks, and I am here with an amazing and inspiring group of people using geotechnology for good. We hope these talks will inspire you to think of new ways that you can have an impact with mapping tools. So let's begin. First, I'd like to introduce Derek Sinyan, Michaela Shirley, and Ted Hahola to share with you how they use Google Earth Pro to ensure indigenous communities voices and values are driving decision-making and planning for their lands. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'm Ted Hohola. I'm the director of the Indigenous Design and Planning Institute here in the School of Architecture and Planning at the University of New Mexico. And um, I'm really pleased to share how it is that we deal with approaching community engagement in various uh, indigenous communities. And the driving motivation for this is really indigenous planning. And uh, indigenous planning essentially is using culture and identity as a way to inform community development. We also have tenets that are associated with that that are part of our pedagogy in terms of uh, how it is that we inform both communities and particularly our students in terms of looking at uh, different types of ways of rethinking the relationship that uh, it was based on bringing the sense of meaning to our places. I guess the biggest thing that is really important in terms of trying to reimagine how it is that we can represent that is to think about how the people are beautiful already and uh, these others dealing with not, no minorities, uh, no translators, no culture amnesia is really related to bringing that voice of the community to the forefront. Today, uh, we wanna give an example of what we engage in our practice uh, in terms of what we call place knowing. And this is a little bit different than what it is that seems to be the kind of mainstream conversation around place making. In our world, uh, we feel that because of our ancestral basis, our places are already made, and that the basic challenge which we meet is really how it is that we bring meaning back into our communities in terms of how it is that we've actually inherited the places that are important to us. I think it's best articulated by some of the elders that we work with who basically have said that the only way that we can uh, preserve our culture, sustain our culture is to walk the land with our children because it's through walking the land that we get to know the places, their meaning, their symbols, it affects our knowledge, our identity. All of those things are so important in terms of how it is that we continue to build our sense of resilience for what it is that we call the seven generations framework for uh, how it is that we acknowledge those ancestors from the past as well as those that are still yet to come forward. And certainly our role in terms of being the stewards and making sure that those things that we inherit are done in a way that uh, are going to be better for those that are going to inherit uh, what it is that we've been um, uh, afforded. So with that, uh, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over so that we can talk a little bit about a very special place that we had uh, the chance of actually working with, uh, Gakona, Alaska. So Michaela, you can take it over from here. Awesome, yeah, Ted, thank you. Michaela Shirley and Shia, Skopanish Ladoks, Wudich, Eni, Shachin, Ashin, Yedash, Shache, Maidish, Gizni, Dashanela. Thank you everyone for joining us. So the context in which uh, the two concepts that Dr. Hohola had described to us had taken place in a Alaskan village in um, uh, Gakona. And so if you've not been to Gakona before, it's about a three and a half hour drive from Anchorage and beautiful scenery. So while we were there, we engaged in a process um, called direct to digital. Um, and that was our form of community engagement and really was introduced to us by our other colleague, Dr. Cynthia Annette, who you know was really um, instrumental in helping us configure like how the room was gonna be set up, who was gonna have the various roles such as mapper, participant, facilitator, and note taker. Um, and, you know, otherwise in our process, we usually undergo uh, asset mapping with like hard copy paper. But uh, in this case, it was uh, a matter of us just trying to explore a different way that we want to engage with community. And it ended up being uh, very successful. 
And so uh, how we framed our conversation then was to really look at uh, any um, conversation around the past, the present, and the future. And these are instrumental in sort of formulating for us then what it is that we were trying to get at uh, in regards to a, a brownfield site that the community was dealing with and continues to deal with. And so here is the platform um, that we used. It was Google Earth uh, Pro. Uh, and so we um, facilitated that conversation and was, were able to plot down various information about where people were living in relation to the hindsight, but then also how they might be using the land um, around the area. And so um, it end up, ended up being a really informative process and also um, at that gathering upwards of like 20 community members were present and so they each had a hand in going up to the projector and you know pointing on the screen where is it that they want information to be dropped. Um, so I would like to turn this over to our colleague Derek who will explain a little bit more about um, how he experienced the process himself. How we uh, dealt with this brownfield um, using indigenous planning and place knowing is uh, pretty much uh, how we normally plan things, but we just didn't have uh, a method or a process or name to it. So when it came to indigenous planning, um, we would actually kind of have a, like a potlatch style, like almost traditional, uh, where we'd welcome um, our, our tribal members uh, and invite them to have food with us pretty much and feed them and um sometimes we'd have gifts at the end and uh an example is when uh michaela and ted came here they uh actually uh were welcomed here um introduced and then when they left we uh gifted them um just like how we would back in the day when we would have visitors we would uh gift them and uh that's called potlatching here um we also used our elders and children to help us plan for this brownfield uh redevelopment plan and that's very cultural too uh we've always respected our elders foremost but we've also always brought our uh the children in to um hear what they say and as for place knowing <clears throat> um our whole purpose uh repurpose um for this brownfield is to recreate or bring it back to its traditional uh traditional self, you know, we're trying to make it into a green space rather than a, uh, a brownfield. And if I didn't mention this before, brownfield is essentially just a contaminated piece of land. And uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see that uh, how contaminated it was. So this okay. uh, slide, as you can see, is uh, pretty contaminated with uh, a bunch of uh, snowmobiles. And through indigenous planning and uh, our people knowing uh, that we want this to be uh, brought back to its traditional state, you know, its native state. Uh, we All we wanted to do is just make it healthy for subsistence um, or for kids to be put, to walk through. And so after hard work through uh, indigenous planning and place knowing, we ended up uh, cleaning it up. And uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see the after image. But, uh, that's essentially it. So thank you all very much for um, seeing this kind of real quick expose of this project that we did on the ground. I think, you know, it's just so amazing to be able to see that transformation. So the next hard work is to think about how to vision and revision that place to bring all those kind of traditional components together. Thank you so much, Derek, Michaela, and Ted. So next, I'd like to introduce Elsa Marie De Silva from the Red Dot Foundation to share how she created a crowd map to raise awareness and help with the prevention of sexual and gender-based violence. Sexual violence is a global pandemic impacting one in three women around the world. In India, for example, there is a rape that occurs every 15 minutes. Unfortunately, 80% of women never speak up due to the culture of silence, and this leads to a data gap. Sexual violence is a spectrum of abuse that ranges from nonverbal at one end, verbal, and then the physical forms of it. However, many women are not aware of their rights, and sexual violence is often normalized 
so much so that one begins to accept it as part of one's daily routine, further contributing to the culture of rape and the silence around the issue. My solution was to launch Safe City, a crowd map for sexual and gender-based violence. This was launched in December 2012 as an immediate response to the horrific gang rape of Jyoti Singh on a bus in Delhi. We used Google Maps to create the crowd map and encouraged people to share their stories through the form. Each story is read and approved at the back end by my team before it is published on the website. The stories are collated and then visualized on the Google map as hotspots. Each of these red bubbles that you see on the map represents the stories. The aim was to break the silence as well as provide relevant information that can be used by individuals, communities, NGOs, and institutions. Using Google Maps helps us visualize the problem and relate it to, relate to it from a personal level. You can zoom in right up to the street level and read the stories. You can filter them by location, type of incident, and time of day. There is also an option to leave a safety tip and add to the collective intelligence. The data we are collecting is completely anonymous and in line with GDPR. The primary form asks for details on age, gender, location of the incident, category and details of the violence, time of day and day of week. This is important because all crime have a pattern to it. There is also an option to fill a secondary form to understand the causation and correlation of the factors that cause the violence. Submission is voluntary and all data is anonymous. We have used the data set in many different ways. First of all, individuals have used it to make better choices for their safety by improving their situational awareness. Communities and local NGOs have used it to understand the nature of the problem, design local interventions, and work with institutional stakeholders like the police or civic authorities. And institutions have used it for better decision-making as well as building trust in communities. Now, let me give you an example how our data set was used in one urban slum in Delhi. One of the hotspots that was identified was near a tea stall, and it was on a busy road. Men would loiter there while drinking their tea and intimidate women and girls with their constant staring. When asked what would they like to change about their neighborhood, the young girls said they would like the staring to stop. So we organized an art workshop for them and they painted the wall with staring eyes and subtle messaging that loosely translates in English to look with your hearts and not with your eyes. The wall mural was so powerful that the staring and loitering stopped and the girls would walk com comfortably with no stress to school, work or college and without fear of being intimidated or harassed by those men. Changing cultures of violence are partly about policies, but it is also about giving people a voice. And by making it easy for people to share their stories and report, thus transparently showcasing data like we have on Google Maps, we can hold institutions accountable. We have several examples where on presenting the data, the police have changed their beat patrol timings and increased patrolling. Municipal authorities have fixed street lighting as well as broken toilets and together with a partner organization in nepal we have pressured the transportation authorities to issue women only bus licenses we have the largest crowd map in the world with over 35000 stories and this has impacted the lives of over 1 million people directly in our safer cities programming we share the data with the police transport officials, education institutions, and others to design interventions for safer public spaces and campuses. Over 2,000 young people have worked with us on designing projects on their college campuses, as well as to create safe public spaces. We need a world 
where every girl feels safe when she walks down a street without feeling intimidated and every woman has an equal opportunity to a quality life. So do download the Safe City app or report your incident on the website. And if you would like to join us, please write or get in touch on social media. Thank you. Thank you, Elsa, for sharing your work with us. Next, I'd like to introduce Bjorn, Tuskeen, and Fatuma from Open Development and Education, a global social enterprise addressing inequalities in education. Now, you may notice one of our speakers was unable to join us live due to technical difficulties, but happily we were able to add her voice in later. So please enjoy the talk. Thanks, Rally. That's that's really cool. Thanks for handing over to us. We're really happy to be here. Um, on the team today, it's it's me, Björn, Taskeen, and Fatuma. Um, it's my task to give a little bit of background and tell you a little bit about the story, how we got here. Um, basically, a few years ago, Open Development Education was working with the Tanzania Development Trust, um, and they were doing a mapping campaign to combat female gender mutilation in Tanzania, which is a practice that affects a lot of girls, 50% of girls and young women in some regions of rural Tanzania. And so the mapping campaign really was there to, um, to, to solve the problem of where to locate these young girls at threat of FGM. And the problem is that, you know, there's so many villages that just aren't mapped. You know, there's villages of thousands of people that don't appear on maps. So I don't actually have any images from the villages right here, but what I do have is some of these pictures of the gates of some schools in the Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya. And we thought we'd, we'd pop that up um, to give you at least a flavor of what that looks like. Now, this question of how do we locate people, how do we locate villages, sparked this, this idea for developing a new open source application that we've called Share Plus Code. Because basically during the mapping campaign, what had happened is that the Tanzanian field team was using smartphones to record locations of schools, of safe houses, of other critical infrastructure. That's a logical thing, isn't it? That's like, why would you do it any other way? So the phones were able to get a GPS signal, but they weren't able to get a location. And so people thought, you know, those phones are broken, like something is working with the GPS, but we're not getting a location. So, so really what was happening? And the solution was really simple. These phones had never had a SIM card. They weren't on the internet, right? So there wasn't the 15 minute time window to get the ephemeris for the phone to calculate your location. And so this is a really big difference between the, the rural and the urban setting, you know, the high income setting and the low income setting. In this low income setting, well, no internet no SIM cards in the phones. And even if there had been SIM cards, the internet would have been slow. Well, let's now jump to 2019 and to Zambia. I'm Fatuma Iseje, Malaria Admission Officer in the Local Ministry of Health in Mukoshi. In 2019, we wanted to collect locations of rural health centers. Unfortunately, because of lack of fuel and vehicles, we needed to try to collect those locations without actually traveling to them. We tried to use WhatsApp to perform this task. What could be simpler than sharing location in WhatsApp? Many of the staff in Lulo Health Centers had smartphones and were using WhatsApp to send messages. However, they were unfamiliar with the share location function on WhatsApp. We made some basic instructions as a series of images showing people how to share the location. That's straightforward, right? Just look at the number and wait for it to show an accurate reading within 10 minutes. For some user, this was easy to do. For others, it was not simple. Have you ever supported somebody over a bad phone line? especially a user who does not have good digital skills it is difficult we soon found out that in some cases the location provided was very inaccurate as you know when you share your location on whatsapp the accuracy is not reported 
So when we received the location, we had no way of knowing whether the location is accurate or not. So beyond Taskin and I put on heads together to come up with a solution. Great. So why develop a new app? There are literally hundreds of location sharing apps available. So why do we need a new one? Well, uh, when we looked at these hundreds of GPS apps available, there was not a single one that made the allowance for that crucial 15 minutes of detection. Apps tend to use assisted GPS um, where you don't need to wait. Also, we didn't find an app that allowed users to location together with their location accuracy. Or to more accurately put it, no apps that share the location accuracy in a simple way. There were many great out apps out there um, and they had great features. They were very powerful, but they were also very complex and they were definitely not simple to use. So there seemed to be a need to do something new and our criteria for the project was simple. We needed a location app, which is number one, simple with high usability for intended users. Two, understands the wait time needed to obtain the most accurate location data. Three, allows easy sharing for of the location and the location accuracy. Four, uses human re readable GPS coordinates, which can be easily written or shared by a voice call or on paper. And five, um, allows the, the use in a variety of local languages so that users in rural areas can easily follow the instructions. So how does the app work? Essentially, the app tells the user what to do at each step. Are there satellites available? Sure, there's a number that tells you how many satellites are available. But more importantly, the app tells the user to go outside. And this is not just done and written on the screen. It's also spoken in the user's selected language. If there is no ephemeris available for a fix, the app can tell the user to wait up to 15 minutes. Uh, and then, is the fix inaccurate? If so, the app then tells the user to go into a more open area. Finally, the user then is able to share that location together with the accuracy and the diagnostic data. So we wanted to share this sharing to be simple and multimodal as, and as multimodal as possible, which is why we wanted to use plus codes rather than a longitude and a latitude. So what is this good for? We think that the app enables less digitally skilled users to benefit from geospatial information, particularly users in low and middle income countries where the internet connectivity is often not available. But actually anybody can use this app for their own purposes. And the app is free and it's also open source. And in fact, if you sp feel inspired by a story, we would love to have your help in developing the app a little further to, to help make it even more useful. So thank you. Thank you so much, Bjorn, Tuskin, and Fatuma. Next, I'd like to introduce Hermes Tuan from Progetto Recycle, who is using Google tools to help people explore, discover, and share outdoor accessible places. Hi, everyone. My name is Hermes, and today I will talk about with you about social in inclusion and about my project. Well, my project is Accessible Life, how to use mapping tools to increase accessibility. I am part of an association, an Italian association that is Project of the Cycle, and we are working in many projects, but this one is the one that we want, I want to show you today. So, an accessible life is possible, and what we need to do is just to discover it. The goal, the pivot to an accessible and scalable platform, we want to create a platform that can adopt on the number of contribution and remain fast and easy to navigate at the same time. Thanks to the ability to add new layers based on the number of contribution. This makes the system very flexible and the goal is to focus in, on giving everyone the opportunity to evaluate. We do not want to decide for the user. We give to the user the possibility to decide if a place is accessible according to their needs. So, okay. What is Accessible Life? Accessible Life is based on Google Earth, and Google Earth is our visual search engine. Accessible Life is a system that will allow you to explore the Earth and discover outdoor locations. 
The search is completely visual. Take place crossing successive layer until you reach the area you're looking for. As you see on the screen, we have a few layers that you can see on the tail is different continent and then you can go down and you can see how does it work with a few click you can reach every place in the world in the picture you see north america united states california and down directly to the park accessible life in google earth is made up a series of interconnected projects created in google earth so it's not only one project it's a series of projects connected together this allow with a few clicks to reach any place, and this is very easy to do. And for this reason, it's scalable according to, your, to our needs. These features make the project scalable because we simply need to add more layers to expand what we need when we need with ease. If we have new places, new areas to add, or if we need to go in deep because we have too many places in one area, we just need to create a new layer. And this is not going to make the application heavy because it's just a different layer interconnected with the other one and then we can explore in depth that with google my maps every accessible outdoor place we use google my maps to define the detail the details of every single place the changing graphics between earth and my maps make easy to understand the difference between what is exploration or navigation and what is the details of a place. My Max looks more like a traditional map and it is easier for many users to navigate. Also, it is easily upgradable because every single project is created by a contributor and the contributor that created the project can update the project every time when she, he or she need without needing to have access to the global project. So if we have new information, we can add the information quickly, we can change them, and everything will be immediately reflected in Accessible Life in Google Earth. Also, we designed Google My Maps to be easy to read, to be understandable and consistent, it is absolutely necessary that the representation of the places is built following a standard structure. All contributors are giving access to, detail, to a detailed guide detailing how to use layers to aggregate information. Here on the right, you see an example taken from the how to contribute guidelines that we give to every contributor. And we want to have on the top the main description and then we need to have all the information about the place the essential services and the point of interest. Why? The main description will give you the idea about how the place is. The information are about the size and how the area is. Generally speaking, the essential services are extremely important if you are a disabled or if you have a difficulty of moving because you need to know if there is a bar, if there is a toilet, if you can find food, where you can park, all this kind of information are on the top of the map. And then you have all the points of interest. That means why you have to go to visit that place, why that place is interesting. The standard structure is repeated in every place in the map. And well, at the end, we want to add that we can give to the user a very immersive experience with 360 photo or virtual tour. This is extremely engaging because the visitors is immersed in the shen. A link to the 360 is easily added in my maps. And so with that link, you can access and go real inside. Let me show you just for a second. Here we are. This is the same place. And how you can see from here, you can really decide if the place is accessible for you or not. And well, working together, we can help everyone. Accessible life is a collective map. It's built by contributors. All the contributors work together and we link all the contribution. So step by step, we are adding a piece of the collective knowledge. Making the world more accessible is a challenge that can only be won together. And working together, we can do that. And it is funny, we have here a picture of different people that is working to take accessible picture in different places of the world. So thank you and follow us. You can find us on Projector Recycle.
that is our association and you can find us on Facebook too. Thank you, Hermes. We really appreciate all of our speakers today for sharing your projects and stories of change. You've left me personally feeling inspired and energized about all the work that's going on out there in the world. This brings our social inclusion program to an end. We hope that you've enjoyed hearing from all the organizations and individuals featured today who are working to make maps more inclusive and ensure no one is missing from the map, from addressing efforts to indigenous communities to accessibility and more. We hope that you leave with some inspiration and a few practical ideas that you can all apply to your own work. We hope that you stick around for the crisis program later today have a great summit, everyone.